city is a perfect blend of the cherished past and the symbols of today. Colonial architecture dots the campus, blending in with the most modern of facilities. For most of every autumn, the emphasis is on study and learning, achievement of goals. But on fall Saturdays, the quiet of the university gives way to the noise and excitement of college football, Rutgers style. 1980 was a very special year for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. An eighth consecutive winning season saw the end of one era and the beginning of another. But even with change, one thing stayed the same. The sheer excitement of Rutgers football. Head coach Frank Burns is Rutgers football. During the golden years of the late 40s, Burns quarterbacked some of the finest Rutgers teams, and at the conclusion of 1980, no other coach in school history has a better winning percentage than Frank Burns. He has brought the kind of young men to Rutgers who know what it takes to be a winner. Each athlete, in his own way, looked to the 1980 season with great anticipation. It would be a true test of their character, but the rewards would be great. In Philadelphia, the Knights would face their first opponent. The Temple Owls had finished 1979 in the top 20, but David Dorn, number 14, was about to show the Owls how to fly. On the first series of plays, quarterback Ed McMichael got things rolling when he found Ted Blackwell, number 43. Then Bryant Moore sliced through behind a Kevin Cardilla block for the first TD of the season. But the Knights were only warming up. Blackwell ran one in from one yard, and later reserve quarterback Ralph Leak snuck in for a third. The stars of the defense were two larcenous linebackers named Knight and Wetzel, who refused to let the Owls get off the ground safely. Number 58, Mike Knight, plucked one rebounded pass out of the air. And then, number 92, Keith Wetzel, grabbed his second interception of the night to secure a well-earned 21-3 victory for the inspired Knights. Rutgers would go on to win four straight, racking up an incredible 133 collective points. By the fifth game of the season, quarterback McMichael was rated the number two passer in the nation, and Ken Smith led the nation in punt returns. Undefeated, men of Scarlet were ready to meet the best. On October 11, at the New Jersey Meadowlands, Rutgers would take on the defending national champions, Alabama. With nearly 60,000 fans rooting for Rutgers, the men of Scarlet prepared to do crimson battle with the tide. To beat the number one team in the nation, they knew they would have to stick together and play nearly perfect football. They did just that. McMichael set the tempo of the day. Probing for the invisible crevices in Alabama's defense, he sent crisp bullet shots to his receivers, such as All East split end Tim O'Dell. Coming out of the backfield, Ted Blackwell made electrifying catches and showed off his great running ability. At the end of the first half, the score was extremely close, 10 to 6. Both offenses were finding the going very tough. The contest would be left in the hands of the defense. Alabama boasted several legitimate All-Americans, but the fired-up Knights refused to relent.
Scarlet offense, inspired by the success of the defense, took every opportunity to gain precious yardage. Big, strong defenders like number 64, Mike Rustemeyer, were controlling the line of scrimmage and frustrating the Alabama quarterback. It seemed that no matter where number 14 went, a knight was there to meet him. But perhaps the best defensive play of the game was turned in by a receiver. David Dorn's third quarter heads up hit on a potential Alabama interceptor kept a Rutgers drive from dying. Defensive co-captain Darren Cherry was intensely fired up, and the Scarlet were waiting for one Alabama mistake that could turn the tide. Then, late in the third quarter, an alert Ed Stewart wasted no time in gobbling up a loose ball deep in enemy territory. The fans were going crazy. One play later, they were only four yards away. McMichael had only to find Albert Ray, who did the rest entirely on his own. It was truly a golden moment in Scarlet history as the fans and players alike joined in the jubilation. Neither team would score in the entire fourth quarter, and although the Knights would come painfully close, Bear Bryant's team would survive with a four-point edge, 17 to 13. It had been a classic matchup. After the game, college football's winningest coach told the press, we didn't beat anyone today. I'd say they beat us, but we won the game. The Scarlet Knights were now working as a cohesive unit. With the sword of offense and the shield of defense, they confronted their foes. All year, the Scarlet defense was awesome. This gritty group of warriors got their pleasure from hard-hitting intimidation and intelligent, quick-thinking reactions. The crowd chanting defense, deafening their ears, they go from stadium to stadium supported by their loyal fans with one aim in mind, stop. In the Carrier Dome, they crash landed Joe the Jet Morris, the leading runner in Syracuse history. Wins over Cornell, Army, and Virginia can be attributed to the miserly defense. Whether they try to move on the ground or they tried to move in the air, the opponents quickly learned to heed the no trespassing signs. Mike Rustemeyer led the Knights with eight quarterback sacks and accounted for an amazing 74 lost yards. Extremely quick, Ed Stewart made beelines for the opposing quarterbacks tackling them with a squat of his paw. The Scarlet Defenders specialized in the crowd-pleasing plays, the big plays that opened up a game. Never content to let the others have the ball, the Knights would steal it back. Jeff Blanchard's steady concentration led to this interception. The ball quickly changed hands when defensive back Bob Campaglio was on patrol. When they did try to run the ball, the Scarlet Knights would simply grab the ball out of their hands. Voracious hitting led to 16 season fumble recoveries. Opposing teams became frustrated 
as they forgot their basics. And of course, to add insult to injury, Bill Pickell, number 62, and Mike Rustemeyer loved nothing better than to sack an opposing quarterback behind his own goal line. When the defense was victorious and the crowd was pleased, they handed the ball over to the offense. 1980 was a banner year. The offense averaged over 25 points per game and established nine new scarlet records. Junior tailback Albert Ray captured the rushing title for the second year in a row, gaining 778 yards. His ability to turn on the afterburners in a flash of a second left defenders in the dust. Number 43, Senior fullback Ted Blackwell was awarded the Touchdown Club Trophy, awarded to the athlete who has had the greatest impact on Scarlet football during his career. This versatile athlete rushed out of the backfield, was one of quarterback McMichael's favorite receivers, as well as return kickoffs and punts. This gem of a punt return was only 46 of his career total of more than 2,500 yards. But seniors Ed McMichael and All East performer Tim O'Dell reserved the airspace for themselves. Behind the fortress of All East tackle Kevin Cardilla's blocking, together they became the top pass reception duo in Rutgers history. The Rutgers passing attack was often a thing of beauty, the culmination of pinpoint accuracy. Here again to David Dorn. It was the offense that would give the crowd plenty to cheer about in the finale of the oldest rivalry in collegiate football. All attention was focused on Rutgers Stadium for the last game between Rutgers and Princeton. A packed house gathered for the momentous occasion and heard speeches from university president Dr. Edward Blaustein, as well as New Brunswick Tercentennial Representative Ruth Pat and Mayor John A. Lynch, Jr. The Tigers were ready, anxious to take the field against Rutgers in this 71st and final meeting. The overflow crowd let their sentiments be known. Only the fellow in charge of releasing the balloons seemed nervous. As it turned out, this was the only time Rutgers had trouble with anything all day. The Scarlet defense was quick to establish the tempo of the game, and the Tigers' starling was suddenly silenced. The Knights smothered every Tiger offensive charge, then turned matters over to the special teams and punt returner David Dorn. Dorn would close out his senior season, averaging over 10 yards every time he touched the ball. This time, he got considerably more than that. Dorn's return set up a field goal from sophomore kicker Alex Falcinelli. But the Knights would score more than just three pointers on this day. Albert Ray ran almost at will on the Tiger defense. And the passing game, engineered by quarterback McMichael, worked with playbook perfection.
Blackwell gathered in one touchdown pass from McMichael. Then Dorn flim-flammed the Princeton defense with a double reverse for another score. Blackwell ended a big day for himself by taking a swing pass for yet another touchdown. The fourth scoring toss of the game for McMichael. When this longest of rivalries began in 1869, Ulysses Grant was in the White House. Steak was 25 cents a pound, and there were only 32 steaks. Rutgers won that first game by a score of six to four. And now in 1980, they had won the last game. Rutgers 44, Princeton 13. To the almost 300,000 people who would see the Knights play in 1980, there will be many fine memories of Frank Burns' eighth consecutive winning season. A finely tuned offense led by McMichael and a man-eating defense would lead the charge to seven victories. The hours and hours of coaching had paid off as these scrappy young knights, players such as leading tackler Keith Wetzel, number 92, and Hartford Insurance All-American, number 45, Ed Stewart, would have their best years ever. All East performer Ken Smith, number 21, would place in the top 10 in the nation in punt returns. 1980 was charged with excitement and the emotion of victory.